My topic, which is the final lecture in this three-day cycle, uh, is nitrogen. And the idea is, what about this nitrogen where we've got a column of nitrogen, it's 78% it's of the atmosphere, and it's sitting on top of the soil. And for every square foot of soil, there's three quarters of a ton of nitrogen sitting on top of it. Now, not all of that gets into the soil, but there's what I'm emphasizing is there's an inexhaustible supply of it. So if you can engage it, when you get it into the soil, this thing needs to be turned on, okay? So if you can engage that nitrogen, then you can get it for free. And really, truly, it's the only efficient method of getting it. And I was just telling uh, uh, John Crawford that two of the dairy farmers I've been working with and doing the soil science for down in uh, Western Victoria this past winter with no nitrogen inputs for the past year other than recycling what, you know, I mean dairy cows are, are like nitrogen recycling factories. But other than that, there were no nitrogen inputs from off the farm other than the atmosphere, and they were growing too much forage for their dairy cows on 15 or 16 day rotations with the day and night paddock and everything, and they couldn't eat up all the tucker, and they've had to take off a cutting of silage before the spring flush in order to let the spring flush through. So, you can imagine in a dairy operation to get that sort of high quality nutrition for your cows and to get your pastures performing not just on less fertilizer but on no fertilizer and to get it happening so that you've got too much and you have to harvest some and bale it up in shrink wrap bales in order to get it out of the way of the next cycle of growth. So that's, that's where I think we really should set our sights. And so when I got designated the topic of nitrogen to talk about, then I thought that's going to be the summation of all of these lectures. And there's been, there's been an incredible lot of talent uh, that has come in here. I'm particularly appreciative of, of Dr. Crawford, uh, multidisciplinary scientist, has shifted from astronomy uh, to soil biology. Now that's a shift for you. Uh, and so he's looked at the vast expanses and he's looking at things in the most like finest realms. And uh, I thought his uh, explication there of the pathways, the tunnels, the connectedness of things in the soil was absolutely brilliant. Well, last night when Costa gave us an address at Molino's restaurant, he said something that is sticking with me and I keep hearing it in my head all day. And that is, he's telling kids you're not entitled, entitled to anything. You're not, you're not owed anything. If you sit down and wait for people to give you what you're entitled to, you're not going to get nearly so much as if you go out and get it. And I'd like to say that my dairy farmers that have been carbon farming because you have to carbon farm in order to get nitrogen fixation to occur. And they've been carbon farming very successfully and they've already got their paycheck out of it. It comes every time they send the tanker truck down the road and they get a milk check. They're getting paid for their carbon farming. <laughs>
and what builds up in the soil, yep, it's building up and they've got mm. like 12 and 14 percent organic matter in their soils. They're carbon farming all right. But if they waited for the government to give them a paycheck for doing it in order to get it done, well then they'd wait maybe a long time, who knows. So that stuck with me. Costa was so much like talking my game. I never got any government grants for anything. And, and my mentor, Peter Escher, biodynamic mentor, uh, he kind of encouraged me in this. When I started farming, I was buying wheat off of an organic wheat cooperative in North Carolina. And the last time Peter visited my farm, he said, they just got a $300,000 grant. He says, that'll be the end of them. <laughs> and it was. Within a year, their grain no longer was available. They started sitting down instead of getting up and going out in the morning. And it's, it was the end of them. And he said, you will succeed because you have to. You're doing it on your own. And that stuck with me too. And I think, I want to encourage everyone here, yes, if the government ever gets around to giving us credit for what we're doing, that's beautiful. But don't wait for it. Do it yourself. And don't feel like you're entitled to it. You're entitled to it if you go out and get it. Now, my story here is maybe well told by this slide here about how plants grow. Here's a plant's roots. Now, when a seed sprouts, it sends out a root. And what's happening in the downward flow, from it, it's right under the skin of the root. And that in that downward flow is a sap stream. The plant is giving off sap. And that's called, that scientific term for it, is the phloem. Now up here where the root becomes fixed, then this activity dries up. But in the growing tip, then this activity is strong. And so you want to see that the plant is, is constantly producing more and more of this kind of root, the live root. And in that sap stream, it's feeding the microbes in the soil. Those root exudates are the, the source of food for microbes. And microbes come running to the feast when you've got a seed like a grain of wheat, which has a cotyledon and a food package with it when it sprouts. It's giving off food for microorganisms along its roots and it's, they come, come running to the, fe to the feast. They're like pigs that when you fill the trough, boy, they are jostling elbow to elbow. And so that's happening here. And the one thing about nitrogen fixation is it takes a lot of energy. If you were running that nitrogen uh, ammonia plant that I showed uh, on Wednesday, it's consuming 10 units of methane to make one unit of ammonia. It's a real energy intensive process. It takes a lot of energy to fix nitrogen. Now, the microbes doing it in the soil can do that without all the mechanical equipment, which is kind of efficient because you don't have a big investment to get there. But they do take a lot of sugar. It's a real energy intensive process. So, if you were a nitrogen-fixing microbe, such as your azospirilla or azotobacters, then you have something that's giving off this food along the roots, and you'd come running to get it. And uh, so this then is where the nitrogen is fixed in the soil, is around the roots where there's a lot of energy. Now these nitrogen fixers don't just sacrifice themselves and give all their amino acids to the plant. There's protozoa in the soil 
that come along and feed on them. And they eat them up and digest them. And about 95% of their nitrogen is just excreted again as freshly digested amino acids. Where is it excreted? Of course, it's excreted right here along this surface of the root. And the plant then can take up through the xylem, the inner transport system in the root, it can take up those amino acids if there aren't more soluble things in the way, like nitrates. You have a soil that's flooded with nitrates and potassium salts and whatnot, then that doesn't occur. They get in the way of the uptake of less soluble nutrients such as magnesium and amino acid nitrogen. But providing you don't have this root zone all flooded with nitrate salts, then the plant soaks up amino acid nitrogen and that in the plant doesn't require further investment of energy to convert it into an amino acid. It can just be used to assemble chlorophyll and photosynthesize in the plant. It can duplicate its DNA and have cell division without a big investment, further investment of energy. So it, it's a very efficient way for the plant to get its nitrogen. Now, where we see in the soil, this is on a dairy pasture, this particular grass was not, uh, and I can see I didn't make my window quite big enough, and I've got a little type down here. What a pity. Uh, I try to make my slides readable, and look at that. Anyway, you can see the dreadlock roots there where the soil has adhered to the plant's roots and that's because of the sap, the sugary sap that the plant has exuded along its roots. And you also, you want to look here at these roots. There's a heck of a lot of branch roots and very fine root development happening in this. This would have been, I think, a coxfoot plant. Might have been paspalum. Uh, it wasn't your traditional, it's become traditional in dairies, to plant solid pastures of uh, perennial rye, which is a very good, nutritious grass, but it doesn't have as deep a root system as this. This was in a paddock where the cows had hugged the pasture in previous wet winters. This is in western Victoria, and they're notoriously wet in the winter there. And the cows punch through that thin root zone of the perennial rye very readily. And then that pugs up the pasture. It might as well be plowed, only plowed wet. And <clears throat> then it takes several months as things dry out before the pasture can recover, and several months are lost. In this paddock, he had a mixture of other grasses. I think Coxfoot and Paspalum didn't have fescue. Fescue happens to be one of my favorites. Uh, and when I tell dairy farmers this that have solid uh, pastures of perennial rye, they are looking at the stars. Uh, and so a lot of times I don't tell them until I think they're ready to hear it. I have to wait for the pasture to get really pugged up first. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, this was on my own farm in Georgia. This is several years ago now. And I planted corn and soybeans, maize and soy. And this was at 21 days. Now, you look at this. If you can see it, up in here. I, I chose this slide particularly because I had a tremendous lot of weeds germinated in this planting of corn. And at 21 days, here's my uh, uh, soybean, here's my maize, and I picked this because maize, this is at the sixth or seventh leaf node on the maize, and by that time, the speed of growth of the maize has determined how many rows of kernels on the ear and how many ears it's going to set. Uh, if corn is a sprinter, uh, 
Jeez, is it ever. It really likes a good launch. And if it stumbles, it never makes up for lost time. So this has, without any fertilizer, even no compost. Now, these, these beds were composted prior to this. But I had been breeding maize specifically for its non-reliance on compost. And this maize at this point had about 10 years of breeding into it. And what I had discovered was I got a greater density of little fine hairs on the leaf which accelerate the photosynthesis in the plant. And I was growing actually a more siliceous corn and it improved its photosynthesis. It made sugar more efficiently and then it didn't have to have nitrogen fertilizer, even from compost. And by getting my soils balanced, then I had such a low soluble nitrogen test in the soil that these weeds that sprouted didn't have soluble nutrients to feed them. And they didn't have a, wor a feed package with them. Just think of the size of their uh, seeds. It's very, very tiny. And so they didn't have a food package and the microbes didn't come running to the feast. They were there to mop up loose nutrients and they didn't have any. And so at 21 days, though they sprouted just as quick as the corn and soybeans, they sat there and didn't make their le next leaf. And you worried about weed pressure. I was getting weeds to sprout, but I sure wasn't growing them. Okay, one of the, one of the best organic seed growers in the United States <clears throat> a fellow by the name of Klaus Martins up in Syracuse, New York. He was showing me in his navy bean field how his red root pigweed, it's an amaranth, and it was this tall, and it was making its last seeds, and his beans were easily this tall. And he said, I've quit cultivating. He says, I don't need to. He says, the weeds have gotten infected with something and they're not growing and being any competition to my beans. And I says, let's dig them up and see what it looks like. And I might have had that slide in this presentation here. Let's see. Uh, well, it wasn't the next slide anyway. But uh, this was the same cornfield that you saw in the earlier picture and nitrogen fixation is supplying all of the needs of this crop. Now why did I plant the soybeans in the middle between the corn rows? Because nitrogen fixation doesn't just require energy but it also requires certain minerals. It requires calcium Calcium goes along with nitrogen fixation and the nitrogen fixers use it up. It also requires phosphorus because those sugars that are excreted by the plant have to have phosphorus in the soil microorganisms diet in order to utilize the sugar for its energy. And it has to have the phosphorus cofactors of zinc and manganese and copper and iron in order to utilize the phosphorus. And it has to have molybdenum. It has to have a tiny amount of molybdenum because that's important for the nitrogenase enzyme that allows these microorganisms to free fix nitrogen. So, and for that matter, other things like cobalt and all of those things are essential. Sulfur is essential to get access to things like zinc and manganese and copper. So what was happening here was the soil's minerals were all tu tuned up. And that was the role of the soybean. The soybean is excreting acids along its roots in its root zone. Now this is, there's a good picture on the on the cover of Horst Marschner's uh, textbook, Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants, 
which is sort of my Bible in terms of the biochemistry of agriculture. It's a big, thick book, and not everyone in this room would be able to read it with much value. But Marshner was a biochemist that really got into where the elements were and what they were doing in plants. And uh, so that picture on the cover was showing, here it was a chickpea plant that had a pH along its roots of 3.9. Okay, it was exuding in its root exudates organic acids, carbon-based acids, like oxalic acid or uh, might have been citric acid or lactic acid or any of those organic acids based on carbon. And oxygen is the basis of acidity in chemistry and that's what soybeans do is they bring oxygen down into the soil and unlock the minerals. But on the roots of the maize in the cover of his uh, picture, in that picture on the cover, the maize in the same soil, a soil with a pH of 5, the maize along its roots was secreting sugars which buffer the pH and the pH was 6,5. Now, not only do they not feed on the same minerals or need the same uh, root zone, but the conditions along their roots are entirely different. And they're hosting a different sort of microbiology around their roots. And the legume is releasing the minerals needed for nitrogen fixation. And if I didn't maintain that in the field when I'm growing the corn, you can't really see it very well here, but the soybeans at this point have formed an ocean of soybean foliage down here underneath the corn. And they're growing, and they're not as efficient as corn in photosynthesis, so they actually don't fix as much nitrogen as is fixed around the roots of the corn. But it's much easier to measure because it's in nodules. So to measure the amount of nitrogen fixation around the corn roots, you take the corn roots out of the ground and you shake them off and whatnot, and the root exudation zone, you're losing some of that right then and there. If you were to try to measure what the nitrogen fixation was in the soil around the corn, you've got a much, much more difficult task. But I can assure you that all of the nitrogen needs of this corn crop, and it doesn't look deficient at all, does it? You know, even, even from the viewpoint of people who are used to seeing that urea green or anhydrous green color in their corn, this is a little lighter, but look at what a glowing green it is. There's really no nitrogen deficiency in that corn, and I can tell you it was producing an ear that from the inside of my elbow to my wrist, it filled out to the last kernel at the tip, the last one on the tip of the uh, cob. And the second ear, though it didn't do quite so well, it did well also. So I'm getting two ears of corn, one of which fills out to the last kernel, and it's not a shrimpy ear or anything like that. And I'm getting it without any external nitrogen inputs. The, the land itself and the ability of corn to photosynthesize and make sugar is drawing it out of the atmosphere. And though it took me many years and, and buku mistakes to get there, I started off... 37 tons of compost to the hectare. Man, I was exceeding that level. And boy, I was poisoning my soil with compost. Uh, it's when I got down to that rate to where I was putting on a ton, an acre, or something like that, that, and then I found with corn, because it's so productive of energy that I didn't even need any compost. So, I'm just, I'm just trying to make a case here. Look at this. 
there was a globule of, these are complex sugars, polysaccharides are what they're called scientifically. Uh, there was a much bigger globule on this root that I reached down and felt, felt kind of rubbery because it's a complex sugar. Uh, and then I realized I should go get the camera and just take a picture of this, but it was already gone. But before it got its roots into the soil, it had so much sugar in, it, in the phloem, the, the downward flow of sap, it had so much sugar in it that it leaked out of the root before the root got in the ground. And that, that gives you some idea of how productive corn can be uh, in its photosynthesis. And the root diameter, see this is all around the diameter of the root. There's a good healthy corn stalk, not quite the diameter of my wrist, but pretty close. Now, I've tried to emphasize that nitrogen fixation depends on energy deficiency, I mean efficiency. But what that means is you have to tune up the entire biological system to get there. You've got to improve your sulfur levels in the soil. And I don't mean minimal levels, I mean getting sulfur up there to a really good luxury level. Which is about 50 parts per million in the soil. Until you get to 50 parts per million in the soil, chances are you'll have the plant scrounging around for some. And in the total test, and I've been a, a, a pioneer here in Australia and the U.S. of total tests, and this comes from my biodynamic background, because back in the 50s, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer and my mentor, Peter Escher, was Pfeiffer's partner in setting up his laboratories and his farm at Threefold Farm in Spring Valley, New York. He was doing total tests back then and was remarking at how much more is actually in the soil than the soluble test reveals. And saying words to the effect of, you, <laughs> he's a biodynamic proponent, and we need biology, we need active biology, that's the dynamic part, in order to get access to these soil totals. Mm -hmm. And in the soil total, the targets that I look for is a 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio because when you get a higher ratio, then you don't get actually as much bacterial activity in the soil. The fungi, I like that. I was really glad to see that in a previous presentation. The fungi I like that higher carbon rate, but they're not nitrogen fixers. So you really want to aim for that 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio to have both the bacteria and the uh, fungi and the protozoa and everything to all be working and to have that humus flywheel supplying everything that's needed in the process of nitrogen fixation. Boron, and you can look this up in mineral nutrition of higher plants, borate substitutes for some of the silicates in the capillary system of the plant, and this is what gives you sap pressure in the plant. The plant is sucking on the water and electrolytes because it's got a hunger for electrons. Borate works as an anion, and what happens then is the plant is sucking water up and as it evaporates it sucks it and keeps that flow going. And the more boron you have in that capillary system, the more strongly it's sucking up water. That's what gives you sap pressure. And you can't get calcium, magnesium, or anything else into the plant if you don't have that flow going. If it's not going strongly enough and you don't get enough moisture up into the plant, you will see in midday how the plant has gotten sort of tired in the top and doesn't have any starch in it. It doesn't have good hydration. And then you can go, it, then it doesn't have enough to give off root exudates and it doesn't feed the soil biology at night. And you go out there with your refractometer at six o'clock in the morning, take a sap test, and you've got a bricks of 10 or something else like that. And 
you know high bricks in the early morning is a sure sign of boron deficiency because if you didn't get it up in there it won't come down again and it'll stay in the leaf whatever the photosynthetic activity was the previous day is stuck there and it's in the way of further photosynthesis and that plant won't be growing properly so oops I've hit the wrong button here and locked it how do I do that oh it still switches okay so you have to tune up the whole system of the plant. You've heard me out there in the paddock telling you how I set a higher level of target for things like copper or zinc or manganese. I want to see them at a little higher level. Quite commonly, well, for instance, sulfur deficiency is often misidentified as nitrogen deficiency. So whack a little nitrogen on. What happens then is it collapses some of the soil's bi humus flywheel or some of its biological activity and releases a little sulfur and then you thought you got all of that benefit out of the nitrogen but you got it at the expense of mining the total test for sulfur. So you actually thought, oh, you know, the nitrogen fixed it. Now, I've pioneered this idea of a biochemical sequence because there's an order in which things have to work for anything else to work. Without sulfur working there as the biocatalyst in the soil and in the plant, then really not much of anything else works properly. It's what gets life going. Sulfur works on the boundaries of things. Sulfur in organic chemistry, sulfuric acid is the classic catalyst to get reactions going that are a little stubborn to react. Then from there, boron in interacting with silicon gives you sap pressure so your boron is what makes the silicon work. Silicon is the basis of your transport system in your plant, also your connective tissue and cell walls and so it precedes calcium's activity. You can't get calcium into the plant and get it working until you've got the silica transport system working. And if the silica transport system is deficient, then you don't have an easy time getting calcium up in the tree. Or even in the grain or in the grass or in the, especially in the clover. And clover loves calcium, but it can't take it up very well because its transport system takes a lot more sap pressure and I mentioned this out in the paddock showing you how the branching in the clover system its leaf circulatory system all those leaf veins they branch very highly so it takes a lot more pressure to run that system whereas in a grass it's just a straight line doesn't take much pressure at all it's a real fast transport system because it doesn't require much boron. But to get calcium into the plant, and I think Joel mentioned this, that you're putting calcium on the plant, if you want it to circulate properly in the plant, you should always use a little bit of boron with it, just, just to see that it's going to work. Now, after that, calcium is what's essential in nitrogen fixation for balancing the acidity of nitrogen. So your amino acids are reliant on a certain amount of calcium in order to keep the chemical equilibria working. And then from nitrogen, your amino acid nitrogen is what you're using to assemble your chlorophyll. And if the plant doesn't produce chlorophyll, which requires magnesium, then it can't photosynthesize. It can't catch the sunlight. So and if it can't transfer, where'd my pointer go here? If it can't transfer the energy from the chlorophyll by way of phosphorus into making sugar, which is where your carbon comes in, if it can't do that, if phosphorus isn't there as the bridge to conduct the energy, then you still can't make sugar and what happens is the chlorophyll burns up in the leaf and you get that burgundy wine red color in the leaf. <laughs> 
and that's burnt up chlorophyll because the chlorophyll catches the sunlight but then it can't get the energy away again and it burns up then potassium really comes in at the tail of this because the potassium look Potassium availability from the soil's total is oftentimes very reliant on the phosphorus levels because until the microorganisms in the soil have enough phosphorus to utilize the sugars, then they can't unlock and make available the potassium. So you, you're putting potassium on, guess what potassium does when it's soluble in the soil? It gets in the way of uptake of things like magnesium and calcium and then the potassium's high in the leaf, but you're not photosynthesizing well anymore. You're not getting good cell division anymore because you've got the plant taking up luxury levels of potassium. It's just the most mobile nutrient. So if you keep your potassium levels up there real high, now I'm not trying to ignore the fact that some soils are potassium deficient, but we're chasing potassium oftentimes to our detriment. And we should pay attention to how much we have in the soil total and how well we're getting access to it biologically. So what I do an awful lot with dairy farmers and whatnot is I do an on-site soil assessment or a visual soil assessment of ESA. And I like dig a plug out and look at what's happening and I look at the soil structure and how how well does it crumble how deep are the roots and all of those sorts of things because they tell me a lot now I also look at the landscape and where I see this is this is a good example sulfur deficiency I see a paling in the plant and I think, ah, oh, that's probably magnesium deficiency because it's not making enough chlorophyll. And it probably is. But it's not the deficiency of magnesium that has caused this. It's the sulfur. The sulfur wasn't adequate to get access to the magnesium. Most soils are just chockers with magnesium. It's not always the case. But most of them are. And it doesn't get into the plant. And why doesn't it get into the plant? Quite commonly, it's because sulfur is deficient. Here, here's another picture of sulfur deficiency, and you can see it, and you can have a guess at what was causing it. I'd say this is where you had a water channel uh, down the field, and it was flooded for a little while, and it leached the sulfur. Look at, look at what a difference it makes to have adequate sulfur and to not have it. And that's in a grass instead of a legume. But sulfur is very, very important for legumes. And, but it's also important for, for grasses. And this is, is something, when you looked at that, you might have said, oh, that's nitrogen deficiency. And it is because there's no nitrogen fixation, not as enough nitrogen fixation taking place there. But that's because there's not enough sulfur to get the magnesium into the plant to make the sugar in order to have the energy to fix nitrogen. So, yeah, it's nitrogen deficiency, but you won't fix it by putting nitrogen on. Now, here's boron deficiency. It's a hollow stem. I forget now just what this was, something like canola or something. Uh, but... Where you see solid stem, and we looked at it out there in the paddock, and we saw a solid stem clover and solid stem lucerne in Bill's paddock, and it was adequate boron in the plant. And I would assume that means there was adequate boron in the soil, because otherwise how would it get in the plant? But you see what happens, your transport system can't transport things from cell to cell because you've got big open spaces where there aren't even any cells. You, there's visual signs of these things. You go out and look. Now this was, this is a little bit different kind of deficiency. This is a two dollar coin. And every one of these clover leaves, even the, the 
the three leaves together aren't as big as the, as the two dollar coin. And I go pasture after pasture where I see that kind of thing and it shows up the strongest in the winter because these elements don't work as well in colder weather generally. But I see that kind of thing. It shows up as smaller leaves in the grass too, but it's really apparent in something like clover, which if it has adequate zinc, can make leaves like this. They'll be big as a 50 cent piece at least as big as a 20 cent piece, but here it's zinc deficient. And you can see this. Now usually, I mean in every one of these cases that I work with a farmer and they've got hundreds of cows and there's a lot of money involved and everything and I make sure we do a soil test because it covers me. I'd be a little bit uncomfortable in court trying to explain this to a jury if he sued me for damages because I gave him the wrong prescription. You know? So I want to do a soil test and that convinces him I know what I'm looking at when I'm out in his paddock too, just incidentally. I kind of like that. Uh, but this is what zinc deficiency looks like pretty much. Now, manganese deficiency, you can see the color here. And manganese is particularly important as a cofactor of phosphorus because it's an electron donor. Uh, it's, the, it's the basis for one of the strongest reducing agents used in chemistry. And it's, it's able to donate electrons. It's very good at that. And you see this sort of browning or discoloration. And usually it's both manganese and copper deficiency. But you can see that in the case of manganese, this is a grass and the leaves are very weak. Okay, go back to silicon. And in Horst Marschner's Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants, he cites the connection between manganese and silicon availability because silica needs those extra electrons in order to be free and in an amorphous fluid state. And so even though there's a lot of silica in the clay of the soil or even in the sand in the soil, how does it get in the plant? How well does it get in there and make the connective tissue and transport vessels that makes this leaf stand up straight? Well, obviously it's not standing up straight. And so I'm looking at that and I see the leaves are limp. And I think, oh, it surely doesn't have enough manganese. It's just not getting enough silica. And so it's more than just copper. But here's copper deficiency. And you can see how the chlorophyll in the leaf has burned up and you'd say, oh, that's phosphorus deficiency. In this particular plot, the total test tested 3,100 parts per million phosphorus and the soluble test 103. It had the phosphorus, but what it was deficient in was the copper, and copper is a cofactor with phosphorus without which phosphorus doesn't work. Copper is an electron conductor, and phosphorus is conducting the free electrons that are given off by uh, chlorophyll and photosynthesis. It conducts them into the manufacture of sugar in the plant, and when it can't do that, because it's deficient in copper, then the chlorophyll burns up and doesn't really matter how much phosphorus there is in the plant, it isn't working. Now I do soil tests here and what uh, uh, Joel showed you earlier was one of my soil tests and over here is my totals and over here is my solubles. Now most of this is too small for you to read on the board, but you can see there's a number of red lines here and the key one that I'll have to shift or nothing else will really shift properly is sulfur. And beyond that, I'm looking at silicon. Actually in this soil test, silicon's pretty fair. So silicon I don't have to worry so much about but I'll look up here and see, oh, where's calcium? Well, calcium's deficient. 
And so I'm going to have to deal with calcium in this soil as well as sulfur. And the most efficient way to do that usually is calcium sulfate or gypsum. But if I calculate the amount of gypsum I need for the amount of sulfur in this soil, I'm only going to need about a half a ton of gypsum per hectare. Because that'll get my sulfur up in the right place and then I can, I can think about, oh, do I need to correct my uh, calcium with something like rock phosphate, which is also a calcium source, or maybe just plain lime, ag lime. So I look at my phosphorus, and here we are with phosphorus, it's soaringly high. I've got, I've got a huge amount of phosphorus here in the soil. Is that correct? No. Let's see. Okay, phosphorus says 5.5 parts per million. It's the lowest one on the whole chart, actually. Okay, so I look at that and calculate out if I've got depends on the analysis of rock phosphate. I like to use rock phosphate. I don't really like to use refined phosphates. I will use super and react it with lime first before applying it to the soil. And I kind of like super if it's cheap. If somebody gives it to me, I surely will never refuse it, but I won't put it on the soil until I've reacted it with lime because it's got such a low acidity, it burns the living organisms in the soil, releases all their trace minerals in a flush, and boy, it looks like you fertilized with diamond dust for maybe almost a week. Just really looks brilliant, sparkly. And it goes straight downhill from there. And that flush of micronutrients and everything that it released is lost. There's a portion of it lost. And you come back next time to put super on and you have to put more and more to get that wow effect. And eventually you get to where you can't grow clover or any of those things that rely on the micronutrients in the soil. And you're not going to have nitrogen fixation because the nitrogen fixation relies on the micronutrients. And if you're not able to grow clover, you're not going to have nitrogen fixation on your grasses either because the clover's role is to provide the minerals for nitrogen fixation. Even though the grass is a bigger, uh, like, uh, driver of nitrogen fixation than the clover. But the clover has to be there to get the mineral uh, availability for nitrogen fixation to occur. So I'm going to put on rock phosphate, let's say, and it's 12% P, and my rule of thumb is 250 kgs will give me the percent in parts per million. So if I'm shooting for 70 parts per million of P in the soil, and I've only got 5.5, well then I'm going to have to have at least 5 times 250 kg of rock phosphate, that's going to run up over a ton. I'd put on about 1,300 uh, uh, kg per hectare of rock phosphate as a correction. Now, on the other hand, if I look over here on my total test for P and look for what it is, it says 400 and... I'm not sure I can see that, 98? 408. Okay, and my target over here, just this is sort of an offhand target, I should look at my TEC, which is 13, look at my organic matter content, which is 5.7, and think how much of that phosphorus can I tap into. And I'd look at my budget, and I'd look and see, can I put on more than a ton? Can I cut it back to a ton? I can probably successfully cut it back to a ton without any real loss. So if it's a, a question of my budget, I'd still like to build more reserve phosphorus in the soil. It's kind of like an insurance program. It's like money in the bank. But if I'm stretched a little thin, I might put only three quarters of a ton on or maybe only half a ton.
and I might be cutting back some of my other inputs proportionally depending on my budget. But I wouldn't leave out phosphorus on this at all. I'd have to put out at least a half a ton. That would be to get it up to 50 parts per million. No, I wouldn't get it there even. I'd have to put out three quarters of a ton just to get it up to 50 parts per million. So I'm looking at this and calculating the correct adjustment. Now, if rock phosphate was 25% calcium, then I'd add that into my calculation of how much calcium I have to put out there in order to reach my target level of calcium, and I would subtract that from the amount of lime I might put out. There's no point in overdoing your fertilizer inputs. It just throws things out of balance again. You won't get any, you know, val value out of over fertilizing. It's not a good idea. Oh, maybe gypsum's cheap and I could put out two tons to the hectare. It's going to cost me the same thing in spreading. So, yeah, why don't I put out two tons to the hectare? Don't do it. There's just no point. You're not going, you're, what you're going to do, of course, if you put out two tons of gypsum, you would leach some of this excess magnesium out of the topsoil. And that might be a good way, and if you really can afford it, well then, I suppose, you know, in this particular soil, it's not such a bad idea. But in Rhonda soil that's deficient in, in magnesium, don't do it. You'll leach your magnesium, and she doesn't have enough to begin with. So, it's like, I do not advocate over-fertilization. <clears throat> Now I'm talking about how to fix these soils, you see. When I'm looking at micronutrients, like down here where I've got uh, manganese and copper and zinc, <clears throat> and the target range here on manganese is 10 to 100 parts per million. Look, why is manganese in so many fungicides? Why is copper in so many fungicides? Because they're important in the plant's immunity to these things. And I would be shooting for a target level of around 80 parts per million manganese just to know I was in a real, like, uh, sort of a luxury condition. Well, I'm sorry to say that if I put on manganese at a rate that would get me to 80 parts per million when I've only got uh, 12 and a half. So if I put on that much mag manganese, it would it would be a horrible like uh, overdose. It would shift the biology of the soil way off the map. It would just slam the chemical equilibrium of the life in the soil up against the wall. So I would never recommend more than 25 kg of manganese. Manganese sulfate's 25% manganese. But if you wanted to get 25 parts per million, you'd put 250 kg out there. And that's only 25 parts per million. And look, I'm only putting a tenth of that out there. So it would take 10 applications to build that much manganese into my soil. Uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to do that with anything soluble like this, but here's another option. You'll find that many of your, like siliceous rocks, granite or basalt or whatnot, may or may not have high levels of manganese in them. And if you choose the sources of silica, siliceous rock powders, if you choose them well, you may get instead of soluble manganese, you may get insoluble manganese and let your soil biology work on making it available. Your legumes will help. So, you want to consider that. In rock phosphate, there's almost always some manganese. In rock phosphate, rock phosphate happens to be a really good source of fluoride and fluorine solubilizes silica. And rock phosphate is going to have just as much silica in it as it has calcium. It's an important source of silica. So these are, are 
other little bits of information that I'm just throwing out there and you probably won't remember but you'll know there's something there and you could come back and ask questions and whatnot. So in, in correcting soils to get those levels at a maximum uh, or, or at a, a really healthy level, then I'm shooting for, for that sort of a, of a formula. Here's what I came up with for this soil. Now I never put these things on by themselves. I always use something that will will hold on to them. Raw humates, activated raw humate. In this case, for this particular grower, this was coming out of Bacchus Marsh, and it's a it's a a sort of a a soft coal mine, and they're grinding up this. Uh, uh, it's not lanardite as such, but it's, a, it's another sort of soft coal, raw humate. They're grinding it up and reacting it with bugs, and then you can mix the other things into it. So I'll mix a little of my gypsum into it. It's going to be deficient in both nitrogen and sulfur. I know this. All, all of these raw humate sources that I've been using are deficient in nitrogen and sulfur. And if I put a little bit of ammonium sulfate into it and react it with the brown coal before it's spread out there, then it's not a harmful nitrogen input. And I can look at this soil test here. Look down here at my uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio is 17.68. Boy, does this soil have too little nitrogen already. It needs to get the nitrogen level up to where the nitrogen is reaching a much higher target up here on my total test. And so I need to put that ammonium sulfate in there. It's not even going to be enough. But I'm really reluctant to put too much nitrogen on. Then my nitrogen to sulfur ratio here is 10 to 10.79 to 1 and I'm looking for between 5 and 6 around 5.5 would make me real happy and so I know I'm really deficient in both nitrogen and sulfur in the humus flywheel in this soil so I'm going to put that in in my fertilizer formula a little bit of ammonium sulfate also, I'm only putting 20 kg of, magne of manganese sulfate, 10 of copper, 15 of zinc, 5 of borax, and I'm putting in a couple liters of sea minerals. This is the pot liquor left behind in salt evaporation because most of the sea salt you buy in the store, if it's nice white free-flowing crystals, it's not fully evaporated seawater. It's only 90% evaporated, and in that first 90% of evaporation, you get only the sodium chloride precipitating out. You reach a point when other salts start to precipitate out of the seawater, and generally, for most of the salt evaporation, the evaporation is halted, and the sodium chloride is rinsed, and it's granulated and it's sold as sea salt. Doesn't contain iodide, says it on the box. That's because the iodine in the seawater is still left in that pot liquor. And so is the selenium, so is the molybdenum, so is the cobalt, so are all of these very important trace elements. Some of them that we don't really know what they do, many of them we don't know. But it's very rich in boron. Boron leaches very so readily that it's washed out to the ocean long ago. So that's the sort of thing where, where if I put the sea mineral on, I'm going to feed some of those microbes that we don't even know what they do. They may be using fluoride in order to eat sand. If you were an artisan in glass, you'd be using hydrofluoric acid to etch glass. You can't put it in a glass bottle because you pour it into a glass bottle, set it on the table here in 15 minutes, it's eaten through the floor. Because it ate through the glass, it solubilizes 
silica wonderfully well. And a little bit, I bet it's not more than a couple parts per million in the soil, but a little bit of it is probably an essential nutrient. We haven't done the research on that to prove it. But it's one of those things. So, yep. Here's just another soil test. You can see it's a much different picture and I have luxury levels of a few things in there. Actually, excessive levels. The blue, the turquoise lines are excess. And chloride was excess in this one. And so was nitrate. And we commonly see this on a soil that's loaded with nitrogen salts is it also ends up being too high in chloride. I'm not sure where the chlorine's coming from in those instances, but it commonly occurs and where you've been using uh, urea on a pasture and you've been putting on 100 kg per month and so on and so forth, the chloride content in the leaf test keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. And it's not a good thing. Chloride's an essential nutrient, but too much is not good. Now, this one needed a lot less. Again, I'm using 300 kg of uh, activated raw humate. I'm using only 30 kg of ammonium sulfate, mostly because the raw humate is deficient and because I didn't have it in the total test. I've got 10 kg of manganese sulfate, everything else was sufficient, and I'm still putting a little sea mineral in, and I'm adding two to three tons per hectare of lime. And in, uh, in this case, I could change that dry blend, just for the sake of argument, and use humified compost instead. See, and I'd put a half a ton of humified compost and I'd get a much more complex picture ha happening than with the raw humates. But uh, depends on whether you have this available. Uh, the test was from a dairy farmer and he's not in a position yet to get his compost happening properly, but he's going to work on it. Uh, this is another soil test and you can see up here in this soil test, just the opposite of the other one, nitrate is so low, it's down there at one part per million. I love this kind of soil picture because I know I won't grow weeds on that soil. Now, that's the sort of soil picture. Let's see what I had for, you see, I had 300 kg of raw humate and I had 50 kg of ammonium sulfate because I know it's deficient in nitrogen and sulfur, 15 kg of manganese and two liters of sea mineral, and I'm using siliceous rock powder, which is what this particular soil needed. See, up here where, let's see, this was sulfur, no, this was sulfur, let's see if I can get it right. Silicon. Silicon was one of the two things that were really deficient here, manganese and silicon and sulfur. And I'm putting some sulfur on in the ammonium sulfate. And if I look back on that test, my nitrogen to sulfur ratio, see what it is here? It's 6.60. It's getting, it's getting in the zone where I want to see it. So I'm not chasing sulfur so much in this one. Didn't, didn't put gypsum in the formula, but I put ammonium sulfate in there. And I'm chasing silica, so I put silica rock powder on it. And I could have done this with compost, and it's really preferable if you have access to compost. Gee, there's not... There's not anywhere near enough properly made compost out there. One of the reasons I'm here is because I support Rhonda and Bill in their efforts to make compost. They really have gotten on how to do it. I'm just, I'm learning from them at this point. It's like they're making really quality compost. And, well, here's another test here, humified compost. Okay, now this was a compost that uh, I have been using on my garden and 
The nitrate levels actually are pretty high on it, and that's because the pH is below 7. And yet the ammonium is not high. So it's only got, uh, what's it say there, 19 parts per million or 16 or whatever? 16 parts per million ammonium? I like that. It's not going to suppress nitrogen fixation. I'm not going to incorporate this compost into my soil even though I'm putting on it at a rate of only about a ton per hectare on my garden. But I'm not going to incorporate it into the soil because if I did, I'd distribute nitrates through the soil and shut down nitrogen fixation. I'd put this on the top. And a lot of times in pasture, that's the only option you have anyway. So, uh, but this one's very very well humified compared to most composts. And you look at the totals here, like for instance, calcium is, I wish I could read a little better, it's 11,000 parts per million here, which, whoops, which uh, you, you have to have a little bit different parameters here in compost from soil. But over here, I've got 28,500 parts per million. In other words, the better part of the calcium is tied up in the humic structures and doesn't show up on the soluble test. Uh, if I look at something like phosphorus in here, then it's, this is not a sign of really well humified compost because I've got so much soluble. But I look over here, and there's far more P, if I can find it, where is it? Far more P here than there is over here. So, is that right? Am I, wait, just hold on just a minute here, let me look. Because this says 3,033, and this says, oh, okay, so it's 10,000, okay, so I've, I still have, a, uh, I still have two thirds of my, uh, I mean only one third of my phosphorus avail available. I'm trying to keep that down. One of, the, one of the other places that I'm concerned about tying it up is sulfur. These are all your anions, nitrate, phosphorus, uh, sulfur, and in in composting, look, we're all carbon-based life forms, and carbon is like, stands in the middle of everything in the periodic table. So it works on both the cation and the anion side and everything. And I look at that and I think I should have more of my anions tied up in my compost here. And having it acidic like this hasn't been a very helpful. So I really want to see the compost pH shift a little higher on this one. But that at least gives you some sense of in making compost and you do a test on it, you want to see most of the, of the value of the compost in the total test. If it's got too much soluble, it's not a good compost. Anyone who comes along and says, oh, my compost has got 5% it's got nitrogen. On a soluble test, that's not a good compost. So when somebody tells you, oh, my compost has more NPK than yours, if that's not a total test, well then, that's a sign of bad compost. Now that was my last slide. I have a, a, just a parting word to leave you with. What is nitrogen? Nitrogen is the first anion in the periodic table. It's element number seven. Seven's a pretty magic number. Now, it's a triple negative anion. It's looking for electrons. And we tend to think that uh, there's a gravitational field and it's the whole universe is the gravitational field of every object in it affects every other object. And the same way with our magnetic field. We know the magnetic field of the, of the sun is influencing the Earth's magnetic field and the magnetic field of the galaxy is influencing the sun and so forth. 
But we don't generally think that the electric field of the universe is universal. And yet electrons are so mobile and the flux, it's like potential. The flux of electrons in the universe, it is. It's, it's not just local or global or in the solar system. It's out there to the farthest star and nitrogen is sensitive to this flux of electrons. Nitrogen is the most sensitive element in the periodic table and it's the basis of sensation and desire in our body chemistry. It's the basis of awareness. It's what in our brain chemistry allows us to internalize the external world in our thinking and in our perception. And so the way we get nitrogen in our diet, in our agriculture, in everything else needs to be connected through the soil biology, through the atmosphere, it needs to be connected to the furthest star for us to really have like the big picture and to understand like what values are. People have lost their sense of values. We see like at the largest level in our economic system, we see criminal activity amounting to billions of dollars just because people have lost their sense of who they are and why they are and what value their activity has. You know, they're looking at the short term because what they're getting in their diet is nitrogen from a bag or from an anhydrous in a cell and it's not connected to anything. It's not biological. It didn't get into our system with that memory that nitrogen has in our DNA. Nitrogen is the carrier of memory. This is what gives us this set of architectural blueprints that we call DNA that has got this, it's a tremendous library. And it's intelligent. Intelligence is all based on nitrogen. So I want to leave you with that thought. Nitrogen is where agriculture really lost the plot in the 20th century. And it's where we really have to consider that how we get our nitrogen in agriculture is of the greatest importance to what we grow.